Welcome, everybody. Thank you for making the time to attend the session. Uh, some housekeeping before we start. First of all, I'm delighted that my friend and colleague Andres joins Control Plane today to head up our North American operations and build supply chain trust for the organizations with which we consult. Secondly, we're both recent authors of various, uh, hopefully not nonsensical tomes, but you be the judge. These are free and available. We'll also scrawl our signatures across them if you so desire, if you want to come and grab one afterwards. And uh, this will be a Socratic session, whereby and <laughs> Andres gives me a run for my money as I attempt to make sense of these slides. And with that, let's jump in. Vexing open source security vulnerability data for everything. Um, I might actually require some speaker notes, so let's be a bit more careful about how that starts. And there we go. Okay. As CVEs proliferate and vulnerability scanners light up like Christmas trees, security teams are under increasing pressure. Can we do better than the CVE common vulnerabilities and enumerations, exploitations, that we currently deal with today? Vulnerability scanning and correlation between the packages we use and the exploitability of those packages in the context in which the, they are run. You will also hear a little bit of S-bomb draped throughout the talk. OK, so hello. I'm Andy. I'm from Control Plane. We are a cloud-native security engineering firm based out of London. We work in North America and the Antipodes, Australia and New Zealand. And we are 50 bright souls with a particular interest in open source and cloud-native security. My background, specifically, is uh, dev like sec ish and ops e <laughs> written more than I care to admit or reflect upon? And my colleague Andres. Yeah, slightly different form of DevSecOps. I am a product manager by trade, I'm an operator. I have done multiple, multiple things throughout my career. I've worked at organizations, large and small, in different capacities, always facilitating the outcome of producing software, and software that is meaningful for the industry, for the use cases that different organizations drive. I am very involved with Andy and the CNCF. We're both part of the technical advisory group for cloud native security. Andy's the co-chair. I'm one of the global technical leaders for the group. I'm also very involved in the Spiffy project around cryptographically verifiable identities. I've put some words down on paper, I've done security audits for projects throughout the ecosystem, and well, now helping organizations make sense and adopt these technologies. Andy? To some extent, I feel self-conscious that I have glorified my book with the standard slide and avoided yours. Uh, it is possible, should you wish to avoid rekeying errors, to download the first half of Hacking Kubernetes with uh, hot, spicy one-liners that you can copy and paste from the PDF behind an email paywall on the website, I have to give a shout out to my illustrious co-author, Mr. Michael Hassenblass, uh, without whom the publication would never have succeeded. And with that, what is this talk about? Not all vulnerabilities are exploitable. CV scanning is a broken state of affairs. Toil less, security teams do a lot of work. Necks are on the line, heads are above the parapet. Finally, everything should be machine readable automatable, and uh, I hope there's no disagreement there. Right, so, vexatiousness runs as an undercurrent throughout the talk, of course. What is the problem? What is the issue here? We want fresh software. Freshly minted software contains freshly minted vulnerabilities. This is a fact of life. We accept it and embrace it. Vulnerability scanning. Reverse engineering the contents of an image or a container image or a tarball or an open source package, it's variable. There is no deterministic consistency between approaches, between software, discovery software, and builds of materials have trust issues. Do you trust build time? Do you trust packaging time? 
Do you then reverse engineer afterwards to verify that those things all line up? Are these things signed? Do we have a chain of trust? Ultimately, these things lead us to a state where we get to the log for shell issue. We don't really know what's running in production because we don't have manifests and decomposition of where we're running specific packages. So Vex, to jump to the end of the talk, is the vulnerability exploitability exchange format. Try saying that five times. <laughs> Vex is a machine readable mechanism by which we can correlate a specific CVE to a specific project under some set of conditions. And, and we'll look at that a little bit more. It's a couple of years old. It is very nascent. People are not shipping SBOMs. They're not shipping VEX documents. If we have 0.1% of the industry aware of SBOM, we have a vanishingly small quantity above that who are aware of VEXs. This is a future-leaning talk looking at what the future could be like. This is not a current state of affairs. Like SBOM, this is a distributed effort. It shouldn't be the last person in the chain responsible for cobbling these things together. And augmentation of vulnerability information is key to understanding how things can be exploited and therefore making the decision, should we ship this line of code to production? Machine readable, good old JSON. This is uh, an extract from the VEX specification. This is not in the wild, if you like. We can see the VEX self-identifies itself and then provides um, essentially vulnerability information saying, is this package vulnerable? Is there a patch that you should have applied already? Or are you in the hinterlands? And should you consider whether or not you actually want to run this software in production? This then becomes a business balance. Is it higher risk to lose potentially millions of pounds a minute, day, hour, by removing a financial services trading application from production? Or would we prefer to accept the risk, everything is a balance, there's no clear answer to this ever, with the understanding that we might have a remotely explo exploitable piece of software running with a web-facing socket. Okay, is this actually an SBOM? No. The two exist in the same space. But SBOM is the composition, the recipe by which we determine an application or a container image. VEX is the allergy information. You probably don't want to eat this if you're vulnerable to this specific uh, biological condition, if allergies occur daily, uh, sort of zero-day allergy style. Why would we need a VEX? All software is vulnerable. We have to accept this as a, as a fact of life, despite some of the uh, protestations coming out of the US government. When a CVE is identified, it's on, it's on the vendor to actually disclose that, to potentially create an embargo, to go through a very long-winded process with screaming backflips through flaming hoops. And it's a misaligned incentive. CVEs from some perspective, and obviously not mine, because I think full disclosure is key to remediating these things, but CVEs can be seen as a badge of dishonor. This project has this many CVEs. Now, that could mean that there's a well-oiled release process or security patching disclosure process, and the organization or the maintainer is very good and very security conscious. On the flip side, it could mean that those things were reported, and the individual thought, well, probably best to sweep this under the metaphorical carpet, not announce this to our users. Maybe the change log says this is a bug fix rather than a security fix. So the producers of code accepting and, produ and communicating a CVE doesn't quite line up properly in terms of incentives. Then once we have a CVE even sat on the registry, how do we correlate it to a package? How do we correlate it to something that is installed within a container image? There are so many ways to drop binaries, source code into a container or a, any application. Uh, one of them is essentially kind of hot loading. Run.sh is your entry point for a container. What do you do? W get something latest from, uh, from GitHub and then execute the thing. You can't scan for that. It's, it's not practically possible. Obviously, that's poor practice, but also just downloading and installing something as part of the Docker file. 
obfuscating a binary after it's installed. Most scanning discovery is done by interrogating the package manifest. That package manifest could be removed after it's used. We're talking uh, package JSONs, POM XMLs, even what's installed by APT or APK in the distribution packages. So it's not difficult to obfuscate or entirely hide what is installed from a scanner, because the only way to really understand is to do hash analysis of directories and binaries. Even then, you can do binary obfuscation that then disconnects the hash. And then finally, accidentally shipping vulnerabilities to production is something that we would try our hardest not to do. So, Andy, question if I may. Yes, please. So projects that are mat mature are particularly good at including their security advisory in their repositories. I can pull it as code. I can aggregate the data. Now, if an organization consumes software from multiple suppliers, oftentimes it's a full-time job to go to a security advisory website to their knowledge base. That may be a PDF. That may be HTML. It may be a TXT that comes with the artifact. How does that change with, with all of this? Reduction of toil. Instead of one person or a group of people having to manually reconcile advisories, like you say, um, we get to a position where we can be, we can poll and we can notify. So in the same way that Dependabot has kind of revolutionized pull requests into a dependency list, let's say, we want to get to a state where actually we get a remote notification that you want to upgrade this because you have a specific security vulnerability and semantic versioning in the same way plays a useful part. Fascinating. Please tell us more. <laughs> Just you wait. <laughs> so this isn't related to CVEs. CVEs are very broad stroke and correlate a package version with a vulnerability. Modern vulnerability assessment is essentially CVE scan, panic, guess at exploitability, raise an exception, and deploy anyway. What do I mean by this? If I have a dependency, or it's easier to think about this in terms of open source software, where, well, let me rephrase that. Software that executes the source. So we're talking about um, interpreted languages, Python, uh, Node, PHPs, all those kind of things. Because with compiled artifacts, you get into a kind of tree-shaking space. I'm kind of jumping ahead here. The point being, if I ship a package to production and there are five function signatures, four of which are vulnerable, but only one of which I use, should the CVE apply to my deployment? From a risk reduction perspective, you could actually delete all of that other code. It's not being executed. It's not on the hot path. It's not actually executed at all. So it doesn't make any sense to block a production deployment based upon the potential exploitability of code that we're not exercising. And we'll, we'll get further into this as we progress. So, so CVE is present, but the component is not affected, is what you're saying. Exactly, the portion of the library. There's no execution path for it. That's it. So what software is not vulnerable? I mean, open source, of course, is vulnerable, or anything that accepts third-party contributions or accepts first-party contributions, or exists as software, and that is to say open source, compiled, binary artifacts, things that exist in the cloud, either software as a service or even cloud, like, uh, cloud providers themselves, your operating system, the bash script running production, anything and everything, because we're deferring trust to machines to run software for us, and humans are fallible, therefore it is an extension of our uh, mortal fallibility. As I mentioned before, we really want to ingest and run new software. Big up to the dude maintaining Orc for his whole life. That's my favorite Orc one-liner. Slightly mind-melting, but it's a deduplifier. The rapid pace of software innovation requires maintainers to security patch, add features, quash bugs, or a rival project may overtake their adoption curve. New software has new vulnerabilities. This is a fact of life. We embrace it. We extend it. It is how we want and need to live. There is no such thing as secure software. This is the most prescient GIF I think I've found in a few weeks. That's the red and the blue team chasing each other around. Software that stands still dies. 
We want to take advantage of these new features. New features bring the risk of vulnerability. Companies that don't ship features are beaten by a less risk-averse competitor. So where is the incentive to ship secure software? That is not going to be answered in this talk. So, of course, widely used but occasionally insecure software. Is the internet on fire? Is your definitive reference uh, accessible via multiple protocols? Vulnerability is a fact of software. We have to live with these things, and our mitigations cannot be as broad stroke as they currently are. So, what's what is the problem? it that we're talking? <laughs> Sorry? What is it that we're talking? Well, exactly. Who knows? <laughs> what is the problem? Software exploitability is all over the place. We can't avoid it. And any exploitable software leads to multiple negative outcomes. Vulnerability management is super difficult. We see false positives all the time. Again, there is no incentive for a vulnerability assessor to not raise an issue. When their job is to wave a flag of uh, terror or surrender, it's the, the incentive is aligned to falsely report a positive rather than incorrectly report a negative. Security teams are burnt out, of course. SOC and SIEM analysts are on the front line. They have to do the work when um, open source vulnerabilities proliferate. And DevSecOps technically means that it's all our job. So the problem with scanning, uh, we might have, ah, there's a typo there. The first line is supposed to say type 1. Uh, type 1 is the false positive. The gentleman is pregnant. So these are unexploitable CVEs and scans. This is the fundament of the problem that VEX is trying to fix. Type 2, false negative. Well, clearly, pregnancy is upon her, but undiscovered packages. We've been able to drop things in either by removing our package installer's manifest post hoc, or just pulling things in with direct downloads, or untyped, unexploitable but undiscovered CDVs. We'd still like to know exactly what our security posture is when we have other things installed. And Very, go on. Yeah, just, just to say that that is fairly reductive way to put it, but you run the scan or your peer ran the scan, everything comes red, and then you need to go line item by line item explaining why, why not. And this is something that is not done in one meeting. This is something that takes weeks, oftentimes months, gatekeeping the ability to move to production. You're not getting the developer productivity you want. No one's happy, the security team's not happy, the development team is not happy. There's just too much noise in the scans. You go back to your vendor, the vendor says, oh, it is not vulnerable, or it's something that just came in the base image. Take our word for it. But then how do you rationalize that to the people who have the final say of what goes into production? Exactly so. The front line of defense are these vulnerability scanning tools. And not to hate on anybody who is providing us with open source software, much appreciation. The difference here is how vulnerabilities are assessed and discovered in an image. Trivi, with my Voltastic OCI, its latest image has 702 instances of vulnerability, whereas Gripe has 748. What's the missing 46 vulnerabilities? Do we care about them? Should we let them roam free amongst our infrastructure? Whatever your favorite tool, disparity in results leads to questions. Are any of those vulnerabilities critical, remotely exploitable, or on the hot path for an attacker about to pop a shell in the infrastructure? Here is our standard lifecycle. Project understands they have a vulnerability, perform analysis, patching, their own internal tests, time frame of concern. Are any of the systems that we're running vulnerable by virtue of running the software and by virtue of having an attack path for an external. And then finally, we go to patch the thing. What do we do with this current situation? Well, we could, uh, we could just do nothing. Call it a day. <laughs> if we want to ship firmware for radio devices, the, uh, the American organization is the FCC, happily I put that there. Um, the version of the firmware is accredited, rubber stamped, out it goes. 
those vulnerabilities that accrue over time are so difficult to update because the accreditation process takes so long. So for firmware shipped in radio chips in the US, it is actually easier just to leave the vulnerability there and build something new altogether than to go through an update cycle. We could do that with software. It would lead to catastrophic results, no doubt. Some other alternatives here, tree shaking source. So tree shaking for a list of dependencies and transitive dependencies is such that if a package exists twice on different branches of the tree, it can be removed and everything reduced down to one, one level of depth. So instead of having multiple levels of transitive dependencies, we put everything in, in the same depth. We can, to some extent, also do this with those five function signatures that I spoke about before. How we do so is language dependent. Some languages support sort of reflection and aspect-oriented programming that would allow us to analyze and do this. Others just need instrumenting, like we would do for a code coverage report. We could take it one step further and actually run symbolic execution, throw loads of uh, runs of the software and try and understand exactly which line of code is being executed where. There are ways around this when you can directly address memory. It is unlikely that symbolic execution would really say, well, this particular compiled binary is not using this portion of binary code. Let's just excise that from the, the binary. Or we get into a detailed code review. Going back to source, this is where Red Hat made their money, ultimately, by providing assurance around the packages that we install. Google have launched the Assured Open Source Project, where everything from PyPI and NPM and various other places is rebuilt in Cloud Build. From a Salsa perspective, just to deviate very slightly, Salsa looks at the provenance and veracity of the things that come into the pipeline. But when the pipeline itself is not assured, and let's say running on untrusted infrastructure, or in Jenkins, perhaps, then Salsa minus one becomes a, a useful concept. There's little point in rubber stamping the veracity and provenance of software if that veracity and provenance itself is junk or if it's intercepted and mutated as part of the build infrastructure. So uh, Google's Assured Open Source project really looks to be driving that in the right direction. But again, it, it's, a, it's a huge multinational style project. And you can say the same thing for Alpha and Omega, the OpenSSF's, um, I, I guess, uh, sort of sub-project which is looking to secure uh, the alpha being the most critical projects, I think we have about 50 of those, and the omega being the breadth of open source. These are huge initiatives and come with a huge amount of complexity. And for those initiatives to thrive, we should be driving towards a common standard. Next slide, please. So, what's the perfect solution? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Uh, zero vulnerabilities. This is what the US government would like us to achieve. It's absolutely impossible. Automated vulnerability analysis. So we're talking about these VEX documents. We want a way of identifying if a CVE is vulnerable for the software that we're pushing to production. How would we do that? Well, DARPA ran a project in 2016 with these cyber reasoning systems. They used 32-bit CPUs to perform basically binary attacks and defenses. If you could pop some form of exploit, a buffer overrun, any sort of privilege escalation, and, and I say you, I mean if your AI, in inverted commas, or your automated tool uh, can do this, then the adversarial tool on the other side then attempts to patch the thing. And you kind of play them off against each other, um, generative adversarial networks are the way this is kind of framed now. It wasn't quite that level. That would be incredible. It would be fascinating and the future would drench us with terror if we could do that. But if you've seen GPT-3 injection attacks, you'll know actually the state of artificial intelligence is still artificially unintelligent. There's very little in terms of generalized AI, in terms of actually learning. And all of these systems have injection and misdirection issues that mean we probably don't want to rely on them as our fundament of security. Uh, what else do we have? Well, again, the, if machines don't do the work, then people need to do the work. And looking at these, 
again, multi-billion dollar organizations, Red Hat, the Linux Foundation and OpenSSF, Google, the, the quantum of the problem is, is insanely large, I suppose. Engineers are doing the work, but their work is often lost because it's not well communicated. The information gets lost in transit. And then finally, what about vendors? There was a question uh, from some of the UK government work that I do as part of the Open UK um, advisory charity, which was, should open source maintainers be responsible for patching CVEs? The, uh, the speed at which I shot down the question, the, the problem, again, is we're taking so much from individuals who generate so much value for large organizations but then the question of how we deal with these vulnerabilities is pushed back onto them, and they either have uh, neither time, inclination, understanding. They've generated the value. They owe us nothing. So understanding this from an application perspective, when a vendor is shipping us something, from an application perspective, when we build something ourselves in our own infrastructure, or from an open source maintainer perspective, again, puts a different lens on the same problem. And this is why the, uh, the multinational organizations make a difference here. So what about vendor provided exploitability indicators? What, what we, about it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> do we want them? Do we trust them? And uh, let's have a look at it in the context of Vex's use cases. So if we are provided these documents by maintainers or vendors, we should have less toil. We should have less cognitive overhead. We should have fewer sleepless nights. That's because we have fewer false positives. When we go to install SQLite 3 in the container image and we get a critical because the way it's used in Google Chrome has an exploitability path, the context is so far removed from our daily concerns and the repetitious nature and the duplication of that effort internationally, every time someone installs that package, it, it really is just expending effort and toil for, for no reason. So reducing false positives will make everything better. And it's very rare that such a sweeping generalization um, can be made, I think. Verifiable exploitability indicators for workloads. A vulnerability, a zero-day vulnerability is announced. We should be able to interrogate the SBOM manifests of everything that we have running in production, cross-reference that with a VEX, and there's an important distinction here, which is that an SBOM is static. It should be deterministic. There are SBOM standards uh, with timestamps in them. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's worked with Nix or reproducible builds knows that removing any non-determinism or temporal data is essential for reproducibility. Why is reproducibility so good? Because you take a hash, you build it in multiple places, and you know that the underlying infrastructure isn't compromised. Fundamental point about reproducibility that requires a lot of effort shifted left. So actually, hopefully, we can, uh, we can ship that metadata about an SBOM as metadata and not as part of the document in future. But the point being is that that document should be static. Once a container image or an application is built, its composition is known. And Ideally, we ship that information at build time, and then at runtime, we revert, or at sort of CI time, we then reverse engineer that information and just compare, just to make sure that actually what we've discovered in the image matches what the vendor said. Nevertheless, that is static data. VEX vulnerability information is temporal. It is important that when a zero day is announced, we don't mistrust. A VEX and X, uh, sorry, a VEX and S bomb document that says actually we were fine on this day, and that was two days ago. So we'll kind of run with that. There, there is there are movements to kind of merge the two. We, we feel very strongly that they should be separate documents, and we'll we'll look more about that later. So being able to interrogate production for the S bombs that it's running, and then cross reference those against the vulnerabilities in a VEX gives us actual insight into the risk of the decisions we make in production. And debating sleepless night syndrome. Fundamentally, security teams should be automating themselves out of a job. It's DevOps, it's DevSecOps, all that good stuff. Toil less is the goal. So 
How does that look? So looking at the model, what you want to contain in, in a VEX is the descript description of the data that goes alongside with it, and what's the status of the known vulnerabilities up front. Do that in an API, fully automated, driven fashion. But to be very clear, we're not saying you no longer need to think about vulnerabilities. We're only talking about the ones that are known. So your threat team should still be doing analysis, but at least they'll be focused on discovering what hasn't been found by others up front, and knowing that they can safely or, or take the risk to deploy the software, knowing what the compensating controls, remediation, mitigation should be. Next slide, please. There are, there are a set of required fields in a VEX. You can see them here on screen. You have the metadata, which includes the author, the ID, and a timestamp. And alongside with it, you will have the product identifier, vulnerability identifier, mapping back to NVD, or other database, could be an open source database. The vulnerability details, recommendations, including mitigation or remediation, and the product status. So there are a few different angles on this right now. Uh, as you can see, we've got one format, Common Security Advisory Framework. And then also Cyclone DX is, uh, is supporting this as well. As we've said, VEXs are not being shipped. We don't see this yet because it requires relatively significant effort from a vendor to hold the hand up and say, this is definitely a correlated CVE that will affect your production systems. There's a lot of vulnerability assessment and manual work in there. The only tool publicly that's doing uh, something useful here is a OWASP's dependency analyzer. Um, we haven't actually called this out specifically in a slide, but it's worth looking at how they have integrated that if this is of interest. So what does a VEX document do? It gives us a map of an application, its versions, and the particular vulnerabilities that exist in those versions. Again, we've got these uh, remediations. Maybe it's just patch um, under investigation. Obviously, the worst state to be in, and it's sort of less, less called out in, in documentation, is we have no mitigation for this. Any CVE, any zero day exists for a period of time with no mitigation. And at that point, we have to make our own judgment. Risk of pulling software from production and losing money versus reputational financial harm from an exploited CV. So Vax and Aswam coexist. You think they should? They're complementary, but they're not bedfellows. OK. This question of an SBOM being trustable. Again, if it comes from the vendor, if it's generated at build time, that's what we want. Secondarily, if it's generated at package time, when that artifact is, and when I say artifact, again, the whole spectrum from container images to open source libraries to individual packages with no dependencies to applications to the usage of those in cloud systems, really, this is a hugely generalized concept that sometimes becomes a little murky, but the SBOM can either be generated at build time, package time, or reverse engineered as in container image scanning. SBOM generation and container image scanning are identical processes. They're going through and trying to identify what software is installed, to, in one case to correlate, in another case just to provide a manifest. They should be definitive if they're not honestly generated container image scanning just doesn't work in the first place. So it is not difficult to bypass these tools. Any sufficiently competent developer trying to avoid a security control will use these kind of manipulations to ship stuff to production. Because ultimately, they have, uh, they have tickets to complete, etc. VEX exists fleetingly at the moment of creation. This really is the point. VEXs are temporarily bound. They're only relevant for the period of time until a new CVE affects the particular package. SBOMs should be statically defined and exist in perpetuity against that content addressable hash of whatever the package is. Again, there are some obfuscation issues if somebody chooses to 
um, obfuscate or repackage a binary or a container image. Um, but nevertheless, again, working on some degree of good faith. Again, a useful analogy is to, to think of the VAX as the security advisory being dynamic, going, going out more frequent, automatically notifying the install base and the consumers. And uh, yeah, again, shipping VEX with an SBOM doesn't make very much sense. It's engendering a false sense of security. And finally, of course, signatures for everything. A signature just means that at the point in time that that thing was signed, the person in control of the key trusted it or liked it enough to make that signature. It doesn't really mean too much more, but the chain of trust, the internet is based upon this. Um, human key exchange ceremonies are still my favorite. So as we draw to a close, what practical guidance can be offered? First of all, there are still a number of issues, kind of rehashing these slightly. Um, what is the context for an SBOM? Again, is it that single application? Is it the library? Is it the set of transitive dependencies that are not actually captured when we go some depth down the call graph, if you like? There's multiple different ways to do it. An SBOM is sort of a broad catch-all term for everything. Um, this question of misaligned incentives from CVE CV producers, from producers of software, let's say. False positives, they cause problems for all those security teams duplicating their efforts around the world. False negatives, bang, immediate annihilation of trust in the process. So really ensuring that we have automated testing and some degree of automated exploitability for the VEX documents in the first place is the first step to generating them that is a very high bar. Uh, I'm conscious that that is not a, a suggestion for most organizations. And then finally, this question of uh, when do we derive an SBOM from the artifact that we're attempting to interrogate? And again, it's all questions of trust. Do we really trust people to ship or disclose things honestly? So almost there, the brave new world. API-based VEX solutions, content addressable API that says, is this thing vulnerable? Why? What do I do? Throws back SBOMs and VEX documents. We have some uh, internal prototypes of these things. There are things bubbling away from uh, other places as well. That's what the future should look like. The problem is not the API. The problem is generating the content to sit in those VEX documents. It is a significant vulnerability assessment issue. Who should do that? Well, vendors. And the framing of the US government, the pushback on suppliers to not have any vulnerabilities is, is one question, but to start to adhere to good software delivery practices, including the build infrastructure, OSS, OSSF scorecard, et cetera. Vendors should do the work here. We also have a degree of independent analysis. Of course, we see plenty of software that is um, independently vulnerability assessed. Some mechanism by which those trusted assessors can generate vexes and push back that is not necessarily just a bug bounty program. We've seen, again, sometimes disclosure of CVEs is misaligned incentive. And then finally, who actually trusts these documents? Mm -hmm. So what are we looking at? Metadata distribution and storage. Where is the SBOM? How do you know it came from the person that you think it came from? And where is the VEX? I mean, they're easy questions to answer. Centralized and signed, ultimately. Um, the security of these documents, again, do we really trust them? And then finally, what we're looking for here is a tighter integration between CVEs, SBOMs, and VEX, the triangle of insecurity, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And um, there's some really interesting work going on with, uh, actually in tag security, with using graph analysis and asking questions of graphs for uh, contribution, beneficial ownership for open source projects in the CNCF landscape. Of course, that same nature of graph querying would, would map perfectly uh, by extension if we ship vexes with those things as well. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, that's what happens when a supply chain goes wrong.
We'll open it up for questions. What questions do you have? If any. Nisha, yes. I'll pass you the mic. Oh, uh, okay, with the mask, hi. Uh, you had a slide that said uh, VEX should be API retrievable. What did, can you explain what that means? Yes. The, one of the benefits of, uh, of container reproducibility, and obviously the, the TAR algorithm cross-platform does not mean containers are not fully reproducible, let's say. But the idea being is that you build a container image, it has a content addressable hash, and at that point, we can start to attach metadata to that hash. It's a SHA-256. By extension, if we can then submit a hash for a piece of software to an API that says, we've collected all the VEX information, then we're in a position where we can start polling for that information on some frequency, daily, hourly, and then pushing that in terms of kind of a dependable update into our package manifests. Um, at some point, that would like that would be a streaming API and it would actually kind of notify itself. Did that make? Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I have a question about the <coughs> about adoption, about real life. <coughs> How do you see this uh, unfold uh, in reality? Like, who does it today? How do they do, uh, do they do it? Who consumes it? How? Like, wh what are the the bits of, and bytes of reality here? Yeah, uh, nobody. They don't. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> this is a standard generated to address a problem, but the onus is on the producers of the software to determine the exploitability and ship it. To some extent, this is a, a call for participation. I mean, we'd probably be better at doing that at DEF CON than uh, the Open Source Summit. But ultimately, if vendors can be convinced to ship this information, it will save countless person hours. And uh, as I say, there are very few, if, I mean, there are no major projects shipping VEXs. And the only tool that really integrates them properly is uh, the only standard is Cyclone DX, VEX itself separately, and the OWASP dependency checker. So. This is projection and manifestation. What we started to see happen is consumers asking their suppliers for S-bombs. And, and not getting them. Not getting them <laughs> yet, but they're demanding it, and the pressure is in those organizations. At the same time, there's a lot of conflated expectations on what will an S-bomb deliver to you. People think an S-bomb will give them what a VEX gives them. It will give them an understanding of what components are affected. An SBOM will not get, give you that. So educating and elucidating the difference between the two and saying, OK, great, you're working on SBOM. Can you also start working on VEXs? We'd like to see those. Other questions? I'll ask something more on the micro level. Uh, to, the, uh, to the extent that I know um, the VEX format, it's it's a bit binary. I mean, uh, um, you do not connect. Uh, I mean, your code do not connect with, with whatever that triggers the vulnerability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But often, risk is a matter of an assessment. So, for example, if you had the red the red hat assessments, so they often they often differ from the CVSS uh, because they know their environment. So instead of a nine, uh, you get a, a six, which, from my point of view, makes it uninteresting. Can Vex uh, uh, consider that, or is it, it's only binary? exploitable or not? Great question. So you're describing the process of recategorization, mm -hmm. rescoring the software. So the format is extendable. You, you saw if we, Andrew, we go back to the anatomy, the diagram of the minimum elements. So the vulnerability space is fairly extensible. And you can receive a VEX, customize that VEX, and expand it with the field of recategorization. Does that make sense? Right, right, right. Correct. What other questions? Stop. We're at time. Thank you. Well, uh, if you'd like to, to chat more, we're going to be around. Thank you for being here. And there's plenty of free books, should you so desire. Thank you.